outside of Mobile. Tolmanville was dirt streets, no electrolytes, lamps, no phones, you know. The only toys we had, we made ourselves. But you never hear any of us complain. First one get in the bed, the one, maybe one sleeping down at the foot and one sleeping at the head. <laughs> Kicking on each other and fussing and the average just typical growing up and just loving each other. We cut wood. He used to take my wood and put it on his stack and make a bigger stack. Even when my brother and I were doing chores, my mind was somewhere else. I tell him that I was going to be a pilot someday, and he tell me there's no such thing as a colored man flying airplanes. I knew there were things we weren't supposed to do. I just never understood why. Now I admit, <laughs> I was a bit of a mama's boy. And she understood me better than anyone. Mama knew even though I didn't say much, I had some big ideas and had my heart set on seeing what was beyond Tolmanville. Daddy, on the other hand, didn't have time for such daydreaming. Get over here. Give your daddy a hand. Daddy taught me about respect and patience. I worked the hard road. I picked cotton. I plowed cotton. I worked sawmill. I was the shipyard 29 years and still walking around. Hold that handle right there. Back then, Major League Baseball was a white man's well, game, something no one could explain to a 12 year old. Just the way it is, son. I had an uncle who played in the Negro League, but when I tell Daddy I was going to play in the white man's league, he'd just go along. And I didn't ever bring that up to him and said, You can't play with the white man, or you can't do like the white man. I never talked about that to him. Because it, it just was, uh, it, you know, it, it, it just didn't look good, and it don't work like that. Segregation was the way it worked back then. And I got my first taste of hate when something Mama called the Klan came marching through Tolmanville. It didn't matter much to us kids, though, as long as there was a baseball field around. In fact, my best buddy Cornel and I pretty much had one thing on our minds all the time. We talked baseball, we ate baseball, we slept baseball. 24 hours a day. And we would go up to hell of the bat. And the one that got to the top of that bat first, he would be the one that would choose. And that would be him. All the time, him. He knew that. If he wasn't there, actually it wasn't a game. We would wait. 
until he get there. If he was half an hour late, then the game wouldn't start till he would get there. Mama, never let him out the house. Mama never really understood my love for baseball. Look, there he is. But secretly, I think she knew this is what I did best. And as long as the chores were done, I got to play. Lucky for me, I never was the kind of hitter who needed much warming up. I like to pretend I was playing in a big game, and this was a hit to win the pennant. One thing I always had was a good imagination, and sometimes poor Neil and I made up our own game. We played a game, what you call cup ball. That is played with two people, he and I. Cog wall consists of soda pop tops and a broom handle. If you hit it so far, it was a single. So far, it was a double, triple, and a home run. And he hit quite a few grand slams off of me. He was just magnificent. If you ever tried one of those caps, try one. Try you some soda water caps and get your broom house and see how good you can hit it. He could hit those sort of pop caps a block, a block and a half. Back then, I batted cross in, but no one ever taught me any different. Come on, Cornelia. I always said cock ball where I really learned how to hit. We usually end up playing cock ball until it gets sometimes so dark that we couldn't see the taps. We played that long. Then we would, we would cook. Oh, Hank would like to cook. We would cook the okra and the corn, the tomatoes, or whatever. But we did it all together, just he and I. We used to play what you call fireball. We would, we would make a, a ball out of rag, soak it in kerosene, and we would light it, and we would throw it. Now, you have to understand, it was pretty dark, away from any city lights, and we had nothing much else to do. So we just keep juggling that thing like a, like a hot potato. Right, go, go. So we ran out of rags or kerosene. Fireball was a good place to dream. And when we were 13, our dreams came one giant step closer to coming true. We heard the Brooklyn Dodgers was bringing a black ball player into the big league. A fella named Jackie Robinson. Jackie came in in 1947. I was playing football in, in high school, but when he broke the, the color barrel, I think uh, that was a sign that we all knew that we had a chance, you know, come into the majors as far as uh, organized ball was concerned. That was the first time in the history of America whereby a black man's performance on a job was recorded on a daily basis for the whole world to see. One day I'll never forget. The Dodgers came through Mobile on their way up north, played an exhibition game. And we heard Jackie was going to speak at the old church downtown. There was just no way I was going to school that day, and nothing was going to keep me from seeing Jackie Robinson. I was in awe of Jackie. And when I finally put my eyes on him, he seemed bigger than life itself. that I want freedom so badly but I don't care where I get it from. But white America just wasn't ready for a black man to succeed at their game. Just constantly being bombarded with uh, uh, not only requests for people for him to speak out, but also requests from people for him to drop dead. By helping break down the barrier, Jack had truly changed the world for me. I had a job delivering ice back then, and because of Jackie, black folks all over America were suddenly Brooklyn Dodgers fans. When the Dodgers played the Yankees in the World Series, everything else stopped. And listening to that radio, we felt like the Dodgers were playing for all of us. Swung on, there's a drive, and out toward the right field corner. Henrik is going back. He can't get it. It's off the wall for a base hit. When the Dodgers won, well, nothing much else seemed to matter. And the way I figured, it was just a matter of time before I joined Jackie Robinson on the Dodgers.
Dodge is the only one I, at that particular time was having a trial in. You know, you didn't have you didn't have many scouts to come in into this town. All right, let me see some hitters here now. The way I remember, I was 14 or 15, but shorter and skinnier than any of the others. I guess I didn't have much of a chance, really. But it still broke my heart to be turned away. <laughs> I'm afraid you're not quite ready to join the bombs now. I knew it was a long shot, but I wish they'd at least have given me a chance to hit. I didn't tell anyone except Cornell, and even he couldn't cheer me up. All right, now. I want the Alfred on the mound. I want the Zach at back. I don't know what was the Dodgers' reason, but I knew what they used at for a reason. You know, that he was too little, I think you said that. They never say he wasn't good enough. Times like that, what I most liked to do was disappear and go fishing. Didn't need nothing but a cane pole and a worm. And somehow, standing out on that dock waiting for the mullet to bite helped me forget my troubles and hang on to my dreams. We all knew what Jackie was doing was not just for himself, but for generations to come. And Jackie failed. There'd be no Roy Campanella, no Don Newcomb, no Hank Aaron, no Willie Mays, no Reggie Jackson, none of the rest of us. The so-called great experiment was working. Most of all, I think the integration of baseball meant that we had struck a severe blow against American mythology, that black people were uh, genetically inferior. Blacks were not permitted in the Marine Corps back in those days. All of us who were in the Second World War served in segregated uh, brigades, battalions, divisions. About the same time Truman integrated the military, Larry Doby became the first black player in the American League. By 51, Willie Mays was in the majors. And many of the great Negro leaguers like Satchel Paige were now finally playing in the big leagues. I was 17 now, a bigger Dodger fan than ever. And I'd pretty much stopped going to school altogether. I'd hide out at the pool hall with Cornel till it was time to go play baseball. Rankin here finish them off. I got away with it too. For a while, anyway. I found him up in the... I didn't whoop him. I didn't do a thing in the world. And when I found out, you know how many days he had been out of school? All the days. All the days. And they spelled him from school and I had to send him to a private school. It was the day the world stopped for me, not because Daddy caught me, but because Bobby Thompson beat my Dodgers on maybe the most famous home run ever hit. As upset as I was, I remember imagining what it must have felt like for Bobby Thompson and thinking, I wanted that to be me someday. By this time, I was playing for the Mobile Black Bears, a semi-pro team, and I'd ride out to the owner's house once a week to get my paycheck. The games were on Sunday, so he would come by every Monday morning to get his money because uh, he got more, because he was a valuable player. I think the other boys made $10. Aaron got $20. He was 17, but he looked younger because he was small in stature and kind of shy. But he could play ball. You know, he would say, I came to get my money. And I started teasing him. I said, come by here, come by here for what? And then you'd get a smile out of him. The Indianapolis Clowns baseball team was here on the Bonstorm and tour. And the Clowns manager say, well, who is that shortstop you have? He's better than mine. And that was Aaron. I'd go out to the ball game and see the little kid out there weighing about 150 pounds and another big kid throwing the ball about 90 miles an hour fast pitch. Wasn't no slow pitch. And this kid just ripping him. I said, gee, this guy got some risk. And so then I wrote Sid Pollard. So I signed him for $200 a month. I put him on the train, and he goes to the clowns. I said, Hank, I said, I don't want you to let me down. He said, I won't. Mr. Scott had come got him that day. 
to take him to the train station. It looked like it broke my heart. It broke my heart. I hate to see him go. I was 18 and never been further than Mobile. I didn't go to the train station with my oldest daughter with. I said, no, I couldn't stand to see him leave me. Now I was going to Winston-Salem to play for the Indianapolis Clowns in the Negro American League. It wasn't the big leagues yet, but it was a stepping stone. I was excited and terrified at the same time. Because, you know, a person have never been away from you. That's, that's a, that's a hurting thing, see? Mama and I agreed if I didn't make it, I'd come back and finish my education. Because I had no intention of not making it. 1952. I was sitting in the, in the hotel down in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and a fellow brought Hank Aaron in there to me. And I asked Hank, I said, what do you play? He said, play infield. I said, well, I'll find out. I wasn't much of a shortstop, but I did hit well enough to leave the league for a while. The Indianapolis Clowns were the best team in the Negro League and the best draw, because we were kind of like the Globetrotters of baseball. Even with the clowning, we played some good ball, but the thing I remember most was how we were treated in different parts of the country. We didn't have no trouble in the South because we stayed in black hotels. We had our trouble up North. You make reservations at a hotel up North or West somewhere, and you get there and find your blanket said it's sold out. They let us play ball in their town, just not sleep in it. Most nights, we'd just head for the next place, sometimes 500 miles away, and sleep on the bus. we play in six towns a week, but people seemed a little less comfortable with us out of our clown uniform. But we've been towns out in North Dakota and South Dakota where, where white kids have never seen black kids before. When they walk up to us and they got to say, that's all right, son, you, you, we can't, you can't rub that off. That don't rub off, son. <laughs> <laughs> if we laughed and get mad, we laughed. We know they had never seen no black kids before. He didn't say nothing. Just rub our skin like it. He didn't say black or nigger, nothing the kind like that. Just rolled our hand. And the mothers felt embarrassed about it, you know. So we pat him on the head. We didn't get embarrassed about that. I'd tell Mama things, and she'd say, just don't cause any trouble, man. Then one day in our nation's capital, we got a whole new kind of lesson in a diner right near the ballpark. The thing was, in the South, you knew where you could go and where you couldn't. Up North, they might not say anything to you, but sometimes they'd treat you like you were less than human beings. Break those plates, boys. You hear me? I said, break those plates, the niggers ain't up, huh? Go ahead. Back then, we didn't say nothing, didn't do nothing. But we also didn't forget it. Figured the best way to make a difference was to just keep hitting that ball. And that, luckily, I did. Well, he was batting cross-handed, and then I asked him, I said, you batting cross-handed? He said, he can change. So he said, try to hit, hit, hit both ways, cross-handed and, and even-handed. It was backwards, but he was, he was batting 400. <laughs> That's when I say he's a natural bone ball player. He didn't nobody learn to act nothing. God done sent me something. I always felt like a baseball was meant to be hit. The way I saw it, the pitcher only had a ball, and I had a bat. That gave me the advantage. By this time, the Negro Leagues had become kind of a farm system for the majors, and sure enough, the big league Boston Braves came a calling. Dear John, scouted Henry Aaron of the Indianapolis Club. Looked very good. Dear John, want to inform you of the shortstop Henry Aaron. I feel this youngster is another Ted Williams. Dear Sid, the Boston Braves hereby accept the proposition and agree to pay the clowns the sum of $2,500 and agree to pay Henry Aaron a salary of $350 per month. This is a happy day for the Boston Braves, son. Huh? Happy day for us. <laughs> of course, I'd have to start out in the minor leagues, but I think now oh, Mom and Daddy talk. finally took my dream seriously. I was so proud of it. I was. I was. I was so proud of it. I didn't think about the money till afterwards. After, lo, my boy done signed a contract with the Boston Braves. He almost signed with the New York Giants. If it weren't for fifty dollars, 
the Milwaukee Braves offered him fifty more dollars a month or whatever it was. So that was the figure that sticks in my mind. But I mean, it was minuscule. So he would have signed at the same time. He was signed with the New York Giants. Willie Mays had been in center. Just think of this: Willie Mays in center and Henry Aaron in right field. The Braves assigned me to Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which meant the first airplane ride of my life. Forget those dreams of being a pilot. I was scared to death. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the cardboard suitcase they gave me as a bonus came apart in the rain. At that moment, I think I'd rather have been going back to Tolmanville. Eau Claire was a small town, friendly enough, but a little lonely for a shy 18-year-old black kid from Alabama. This was the Northern League, Class C ball, which meant I was still a long way from being in the big leagues. But only five years after Jackie broke in, I now had a clear path to the majors. I was on my way to being named the league's rookie of the year, but something happened while I was playing shortstop that almost made me quit the game for good. I replayed it in my head a thousand times, and the fans didn't let me forget it. His name was Chuck Wise, and they took him to the hospital with a concussion. And even after I found out he was going to be all right, I was so upset, I really thought about giving up baseball altogether. I didn't want to spend another night at that YMCA, and I decided I was going home. Mama, I'm telling you, I just... I just can't take it no more. You gotta believe it. He just don't like me. He told me he called one day. He was crying on the telephone. He said, you know what? He said, I'm coming home. His older brother was there then. And so I said, hold to you. I said, he don't want to come home. I said, talk with him. No, I don't want to talk. No, I don't want to talk to him. I just told him, look. You, you know how things is back here. Yeah. I know. And it's better there where you're at. I know. You know what I mean? You're making a living. But you just don't understand. And you got a chance to move you, from there. You just don't. All you got to do is just keep your head up and play ball. All right. You know what I mean? The next season, the Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee and they sent me to spring training camp in Waycross, Georgia. The team bus brought us into town on an off day, and I got caught admiring my new haircut. You're gonna catch that bus, boy. Missing the bus meant I had to walk back to camp. By the time I got there, it was way past dark. Now, a black man walking in the woods at night in Waycross, Georgia, was what you might call an endangered species. figured if I survived that, I could survive anything, including playing in a town where no black players had ever played before. They sent three of us to break the color line in Jacksonville, where Jackie Robinson had once been padlocked out of the stadium. Now, you're not going to be able to eat with your teammates. The Jacksonville team owner knew what we'd be up against. He talked about what Jackie had gone through and about how this would open another door for blacks. But I was only 19 and I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I want you to prove something to all those ignorant people out there. Don't make your eyes out there. I don't think it bothered me until I met Aaron, and he was playing when he was playing here. And the names that he was called, all the black players, Mantia, Ghana, all of them were called back uh, racist names. Chigaboos. Niggers. Whatever came to their mind, that's what they called them. Well, you have to understand, we were in a black section. We didn't sit in the main stadium. There was a little place over there for blacks. You'd hear it, you'd see it. What could you say? When you're playing on the same ball club with white boys, or white men, whatever, and you have to sit on the bus, 
for them to bring you a sandwich outside. They go to their nice hotels and you go to a rooming house. Sure, they were hard feelings. But they never let it bother them. They played the same game of baseball. Probably made us try a little harder, knowing what was at stake and how closely we were being watched. Here comes Henry Aaron for the first trip to the plate in a Jacksonville uniform, and he hits it over the center field wall. And in the broadcast booth, I remember saying, baseball fans of this area, Jacksonville, Florida, baseball has just been integrated. I hit 362 in Jacksonville and led the Sally League in just about everything but hotel reservations. But more important, we were accepted by the people in Jacksonville and opened people's eyes all over the South to what blacks could accomplish if given the chance. But it was a Sunday afternoon, daylight. I was presenting Henry with the Sally League Most Valuable Player Award. And while we were out there at home plate, in front of the photographers and everything, the Jacksonville fans had taken up a collection, and I was presented with what they referred to as going home money. As a show of our appreciation, let's hear for our own Henry M. MVP. Well, I sure did appreciate the cleanup effort. Because after the season, I got married to Barbara Lucas, and I knew I'd need every dollar of it. Fact is, I also used some of that money to buy Mom and Daddy a TV set. First one in Tolmanville. Hello, Ronald Reagan. Good evening. Good night, General Electric. People were always dropping by the house to see that TV. Mama baked my favorite, a coconut cake because she knew I was bringing Barbara over. Oh, here's I had some big news to break to everyone. The Braves had decided to give me a chance to make the big league club in 54. This was what I'd been waiting for. Here I was, not even old enough to vote, and I found myself on the same field as Jackie Robinson and the Dodgers. Then the Yankees came to town, and there was Mickey Mantle. By this point, Bobby Thompson, the guy whose home run had beaten the Dodgers, had become a teammate of mine. You know, I've never had any trouble staying in shape. I've been fortunate, you know, to stay injury-free, and, you know, I've kind of been lucky that way. Of course, I proceeded to go out and break my ankle sliding into second base that day. Much as I hated to see it happen, Bobby's injury put me in the starting lineup for the Braves. You know, I've... I've said to Hank before, I said, Hank, do you realize if I hadn't broke my ankle, you might never have made it? They told me I'd be playing left field and batting fifth in the season opener. The first game was in Cincinnati, but as if my opening day jitters weren't bad enough, one of my teammates mistook me for the clubhouse board. An honest mistake, I tried to tell myself. And then as I made my way to my locker for my very first big league game, I noticed they'd misspelled my name. Welcome to the show, boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, they also gave me number five as a rookie. Told me I was too skinny to have a double-digit number. The Braves had made an outfielder out of me by now. Guess they'd seen enough of me kicking the ball around the infield, and I felt much more at ease out there. I wasn't that comfortable with big league pitching yet but still hit 280 with 13 homers and was runner-up for rookie of the year. Sometimes I had to pinch myself. Here I was 20 years old, and already my dream had come true. In the same year, the dream of black people all over America was finally coming true as well. I will never forget in 1954, uh, when I was 14 years old, hearing of the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education. In a landmark decision, the Supreme Court rules that students cannot be segregated by law on the basis of race. The decision created a great deal of excitement, a great deal of hope, a great deal of optimism. Created a climate that said we can fight. There is a better way to bring about a better society. But that didn't happen. They want to throw white children and colored children into the melting pot of integration out of which will come a conglomerated 
a lot of mongrel class of people. Both races will be destroyed in such a movement. But there was progress in baseball, where 12 of the 16 teams had been integrated by this point. We were determined to keep chasing the dream for as long as it took. After my rookie year, I went on a barnstorming tour with Jackie, Don Newcomb, and some of the Dodgers. Start the bidding at, at night, I'd just oh, yeah. sit and listen to what seemed like the wisest men in the world. 32 diamonds in the trunk. We played Pinochle, and Hank sat there in awe. I remember him as a young kid, and he was there in awe, his little skinny self. He, I didn't know he was going to become the star that he became. But we talked about what our state was from 1947 now to 1954, seven years. Uh, what we were going to do about, about things that, we, that was important to us, we could do as a team or as a group. And we made significant strides in, uh, in getting uh, other civil rights people involved and in, in, interested in what we were doing. Seems like going to be eight of us in the Dodgers next year. I don't think they're ready for that. Well, they better be. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, a minister named King talk about boycotting the city buses in Montgomery. Yeah. 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 We, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, have been involved in a non-violent protest against uh, the injustices which we have experienced on the buses for a number of years. Milwaukee seemed like a million miles from the Jim Crow South where I'd grown up. And in the mid-50s, it was as close as a black ball player could come to baseball heaven. Milwaukee is a baseball town, you have to understand. They don't care if you're black, white, yellow, green, or purple, as long as you're winning. I was more confident now and knew what to expect from big league pitching. All of a sudden in, in 55, he seemed to come alive as, as a hitter. Maybe it was getting my number 44 that made me feel like I belonged in the big league. Not many remember the Hank Aaron of the 50s, young, magnificent wrists. There were just bullets hit all over the place. There was a greatness to him right from the start that was absolutely unmistakable. When Hank hit them, they were like tee shots. I saw Hank hit home runs off his ear, home runs off his shoestrings. Uh, if the ball looked good, Hank hit it. You know, for me, he was probably the best hitter, or the toughest hitter for me to get out that I ever faced. There were so many good hitters with, you know, Mays and Clemente and Robinson and Aaron. But uh, for me, uh, I would have to pick Henry as the toughest one. Sandy Koufax walked me in his first big league inning. And later he gave me the nickname I liked the most. Well, I don't know if I originated the nickname Bad Henry. But uh, that's the way I felt about it. <laughs> Hated him, the son of a gun. He beat us all the time. Henry Aaron for flat out hitting. You've got to rank him with or above Musial, Williams. It seemed like his swing was effortless, effortless. I mean, just, but he had quick wrists. I mean, he was very seldom fooled on a pitch. And uh, he probably had the quickest wrists of anybody in, in baseball. We were all surprised that he didn't hit 400 in any particular year because he had all the things possible. You know, he, he hit the ball hard, he hit it often, and he could run. And you know, a lot of people don't understand Hank Aaron was an outstanding base stealer. Uh, but Hank only stole a base when the team needed a stolen base, but Hank could have stole a lot of bases had he wanted to. I used to like watch Henry run. Hank could run. I mean, uh, he, he just did everything. I mean, uh, he didn't look real good in a suit. Hank was, uh, you know, a big idol of mine. I mean, I wore 44 simply because Hank Aaron wore 44. I don't really think there was anything uh, Mays could do that Aaron couldn't do as well, to be honest with you. I just don't think Aaron did it with quite as much flair. Hank Aaron does everything Willie Mays does, but his hat doesn't fall off. As a player, I don't think I've ever seen a, a ball player that is as good an all-around ball player. Hit and run and throw, and he just did everything right. I took a lot of pride in doing whatever the team needed. 
including playing second base at times. The Braves were building a contender, even if it sometimes seemed like no one outside of Milwaukee was paying any attention. I think if he'd have played in New York, he would have had more recognition than he would playing somewhere else. Uh, uh, anytime you play around New York, you get all kinds of uh, exposure, television-wise, and uh, that's nothing to take away from Hank. Hank was always as good as Willie and Mickey and the Duke, but uh, he was stuck in Milwaukee. Milwaukee was you know, just sort of an incredible place in the mid-50s, the early 50s. When you went to the ballpark, you know, it was always full. It was just a packed house every night. It was a time before free agency, and the fact that a lot of the players would play their whole careers in one city, which is a rarity today. So there was an allegiance between the players and the fans. Uh, you saw a player grow up and grow old you know, in the same place. There was a freshness, there was a sincerity, there was a, there was a love affair. Didn't matter whether you were black or white, you were a Milwaukee brave and you were young and you were good and, and the community loved you and it was, it was, it's what it's supposed to be. What a great feeling. Uh, these people love their ball club and, uh, you know, if you're the owner of the Milwaukee Braves or a, a part of it in any way, you just felt like, Wow, we can't do anything wrong. I don't, I don't believe we'd ever got arrested if we did something bad in Milwaukee. I don't think we had to pay for anything in Milwaukee except produce and soap products. We had a new car to drive, and we had gasoline, laundry, dry cleaning, the whole works. Happy days. Milwaukee days were happy days. What's the purpose of your visit to Earth? Uh, Pepe's recall. <laughs> I am here on a to collect specimens for our sampling on our planet. No kidding. Is it? Anybody ever get to us? Yes. What, the president? Oh, no, 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 not in Milwaukee. In, uh... Are you gonna take Hank Aaron? Hank Aaron? No, no. <laughs> he is too famous. We would have to trade the entire planet for him. The 57 season was almost too good to be true. I won my only MVP award and was up to $30,000 in salary. At age 23, I felt like I could do just about anything I wanted on the baseball field. And it looked like this might be the Braves here as well. Do you think that your chances of winning, as you say, I say Milwaukee will win the pennant, are stronger now than they were when you wrote it? Well, I think they're bearing out what we brought in the article. We'll make it tonight, and we'll go all the way. I'm sure of that. So is everybody else here in Milwaukee. Finally, we found ourselves one win from bringing Milwaukee a first pennant. We were playing the Cardinals at home, and Braves fans were ready to erupt. The game went to the 11th inning, and Johnny Logan lined a single to center. With the winning run at first and two out, I was due up with a chance to do what I'd always dreamed about. It's to Henry Aaron, a swing and a drive back in the center field, going back toward the wall. It's back at that first. As my teammates lifted me on their shoulders, I thought of how they carried Bobby Thompson off the field after his home run beat my Dodgers. They are carrying Henry Aaron away from the plate. He just had a home run over the center field fence. We did it. I thought of how I'd almost quit the game five years ago in Eau Claire, of all I'd gone through in Jacksonville, and of what they'd think when they heard the news back in Tolmanville. We're standing in center field, right center in the bullpen, and he hit the ball, and it was up in the air, and you said, no, it's not, not going to make it. And it just seemed like, it just, like somebody helped it. <laughs> but most of all, I thought of how lucky I was to be living out this dream, and that no matter how long I played the game of baseball, nothing could possibly top this. It wasn't until the next morning that I realized we were sharing the headlines with a very upsetting story from Arkansas. Isn't it a paradox that here you have a black man being carried off the field in victory celebration in Milwaukee, which he was, and you have this terrible, terrible scene in Little Rock, Arkansas, on the same day, on the same night. 
Governor Orville Faubus orders him the National Guard to prevent black students from enrolling in Little Rock Central High. Hey, hey, hey. I will not force my people to integrate against their will. When you hit that ball, did you know it was going to go into the fence? Well, I hit it real good. I know that. What was the first thing your teammates said to you? The first man that reached you? Well, I don't remember. I was so excited myself. <laughs> we had quite a send-off before the World Series. Milwaukee fans never missed a chance to throw a party. Now all we had to do was beat the big, bad Yankees. This was the first I'd been to Yankee Stadium, or the house that Ruth built, as they called it. Now, I've always said, if your spine doesn't tingle the first time you're in a World Series, then you're dead and don't know it. It's a showdown between Mantle and Aaron, the game's two most dangerous hitters. They had a great pitching staff. And like Yogi said, you know, pitching is 90% of the game, and the other 30% is mental. So. Leave it to old Yogi to not let the truth get in the way of a good story. He'd come up to hit, and I told him uh, come up to batter's box, and he had the uh, label the wrong way. I said, Hank, you got the, the label up the wrong way. I said, turn around so you could read it. He said, I didn't come up to read, Yogi. I come up to hit. In game two, Hank Aaron tees off on the Yanks' Bobby Shantz and sends a shot over Mickey Mantle's head for a triple. We won game two to tie up the series. And suddenly it seemed like maybe we had a chance to slay the Goliath of baseball. Brave fans were considered the most rabid in all of baseball. And they didn't take too kindly to some of the Yanks calling their town Bushville. Now you have to understand, Milwaukee had never hosted a World Series before. And since the Yanks seemed to be in it every year, we were huge underdogs and loving every minute of it. I think Bobby was already counting that World Series check and I was feeling like I could hit anything they threw up there. We were all by that time thinking, you know, this guy can hurt us. Casey goes out and talks to Sturdivant, and uh, Tom uh, was wanting to put him on base. I think first base was open, and Casey come out to the mound, and Tom said, uh, why don't we put him on? And Casey said, no. Nah. He said, the wind's blowing in so hard that so Babe Ruth couldn't even hit a home run in this, in this wind. Tom went ahead and pitched to him, and Hank, <laughs> Hank hit one. And we go back into the dugout, and Tom said to Casey, he said, I thought you said uh, Babe Ruth couldn't even hit one in that wind, Casey. And he said, that wasn't Babe Ruth. <laughs> we took a three-game to two lead and needed just one more win to wrap it up. But we'd have to do it in Yankee Stadium. Sterling delivers to Aaron in the seventh, and he hits a long drive to left field. It's the third home run of the series for the Brave Slugger and ties the game at two. I was having quite a series, 11 hits and all. But still, we lost game six, which meant we were going to have to win a seventh game in Yankee Stadium, a near impossible feat. The Braves knock out Larson in the third, and Bobby Shantz comes on in relief. First man he faces is Hank Aaron. Curve swung on a ground ball. It's in a center field base hit. Eddie Matthews racing around third base to score. Braves take a 5 nothing lead into the ninth. Hank Aaron has pulled around in left center field. The breeze is blowing across from left to right. Burdett's pitch swung on. Line grip by Matthews has slipped from third. And the World Series is over, and the Milwaukee Braves are the new world champions of baseball. Lou Burdett won three games and got the MVP award. This was the perfect ending to a perfect season. Back in Milwaukee, Something like a half million people turned out, and they put on a celebration the likes of which Bushville had never seen before. Coming off that plane made me realize how much baseball meant to these people. I couldn't possibly have imagined that struggles would lie ahead. All I knew was I had four years in the big leagues under my belt and a World Series ring on my finger. For this night, anyway. I felt like I was on top of the world. Henry, that's for you, buddy. <laughs> Today on Home Run Derby, Henry Aaron will meet his slugging teammate from the Milwaukee Braves, Eddie Matthews. Henry, were you a bonus player? 
No, Mark, the only thing that I got was a paper suitcase that fell apart in the rain. <laughs> That's the only thing. All tied up at three and three, Henry Aaron and Eddie Matthews on home run derby. Uh -oh. High fly ball going back deep in the left center field. This could be a $2,000 hit. It is gone over the left field wall for the home run, and Henry Aaron wins it by a score of four to three. Quite a battle you fellows put on. Well, only one of us could win, so I'm glad it was me. <laughs> now, there's an honest answer. I took that money and bought me a brand new Chevy. But on the way to spring training, I was reminded that no matter what I did on the ball field, some people would always see me as just another nigger. When I told my teammates what happened the next day in camp, they seemed more worried about me telling the press than about how I was feeling. Mama wouldn't have approved, but this time I just had to speak my mind. Something inside of me was changing. As he, you know, became more and more of a star, I think maybe he uh, felt obligated to, uh, to start talking more. Maybe it was because Jackie Robinson had retired, but I was definitely feeling a sense of responsibility now. After all, blacks had moved from tokenism to a leadership role in the game, and it was up to us to continue what Jack had started. But we all had one common goal, and that was to, uh, as a second uh, tier of black players and players, as well as we could, to uh, leave a legacy for those kids who would follow. So much of America identified with baseball. And they saw these black men playing with the best. These young men have paved the way. And I think baseball made a great contribution toward ending segregation and racial discrimination. This isn't a conflict between black folk and white folk in the final analysis. I'm really lucky that I never got into any trouble but I spent probably the first two or three or four years of my baseball career, my Major League Baseball career, fighting in bars and restaurants and things because people didn't want me in there. It is a tension between justice and injustice. The first words that I heard from the fans in the town that I was playing in was hit that nigger another one. But it will be a victory for justice, a victory for democracy, a victory for all of God's children in this city. And as I approached the stadium, the little gate where the players go in, there was two guys standing there, one with the trench coat on. And it didn't dawn on me at the time why the guy have a trench coat on in the kind of heat. And he had that funny looking look on his face and there was some eeriness about him as I was approaching. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it was just... And then when I got up there, he opened his trench coat, up popped the shotgun, put it here in his head and said, nigga, if you play tonight, we're gonna blow your brains out. The civil rights struggles turned violent as black people's patience ran out. But in the early 60s, baseball showed what was possible, as every big league team was now successfully integrated. People could actually see us out there, hand in hand and side in side by the white players. And they can see us in a mingling. They know that that wasn't going on in the neighborhood. Whatever part we played, there was no mistake in the signs of progress all around us. President Lyndon Johnson signs the historic 1964 Civil Rights Act into law. The, the signing of the Civil Rights Act was one of the most meaningful thing any American president have done in a long time, probably since uh, Lincoln uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation. I got to thank the president personally. And by 65, I decided it was time for baseball to take the next step. When Ang was speaking out, I said, oh, my goodness, what is this? Hank, you've lost it. You've gone crazy. I used to shake my head and say, boy, Hank, you better be quiet, you know, because in those days, even then and a little earlier, you know, baseball executives could bury you. They could bury a black ball player. By this point in my career, I was feeling pretty secure. I was starting my 12th big league season and my younger brother Tommy was now my teammate. Trouble was, the Braves had fallen on hard times and the love affair with Milwaukee was over. It was time to say goodbye to my adopted home. 
the thing that I can remember most about Milwaukee is the, the way that they have opened their hearts up and accepted me and my family into their heart. Coming up for my last time at bat, the fans made it clear how they felt about me. But it wasn't a happy ending. With the Braves down by a run in extra inning, I hit a fly ball that turned into a game-inning double play. I was pretty sad to leave Milwaukee. The Braves were moving to Atlanta, Georgia to become the first major league team in the Deep South, thanks to a pretty shrewd group of Georgia businessmen. We built the stadium for major league baseball on land we didn't own with money we didn't have for teams we hadn't signed. We had no idea how much a big league ball team meant to the people of the South. It was sports integrated, racially integrated sports teams that brought about the, the change that I think has saved the South. And I would not have ever been considered seriously uh, as a presidential candidate had that not been done before I ran for office. Seemed like everyone was eager to see how Hank Aaron would do in Atlanta. I remember being downtown when uh, Hank Aaron came by and I was standing with a bunch of the good old boys from Georgia and one of them said to the other, you know, if we're gonna be a big league city, that guy is gonna have to be able to buy a house anywhere he wants to in this town. It was more important to me that any black man, not just Hank Aaron, could buy that house. But it wasn't gonna be easy. The man kept calling Aaron a nigger, sitting directly behind me. I got up, I went to the concession stand, I got a hamburger, I filled it up with mustard and ketchup, and when he said it again, put it in his face. Sometimes I felt like we were back to square one. But like Jackie taught me, I had to keep those concerns from affecting my game. He was uh, the machine everywhere. When we moved from Milwaukee to Atlanta, we moved the machine with us. That's what we did. The ball carried real well in Atlanta. And my first year there, I hit 44 homers. First, he changed himself into a home run hitter because of the changed circumstances. He was in a different ballpark, being pitched to differently, and he reacted by becoming a more dangerous hitter. I saw a chance to reach some milestones now, like my first $100,000 contract, which came in 67, and 500 home runs, a mark reached by only seven players before me. Aaron waiting, the stretch. Here's a pitch. Swung on, there she goes! Way back! This ball! And as he ran the bases, a large segment of America was running with him. And he was saying to America, I want to participate and share in the dream. The reputation that Hank Aaron established was that of a man who was big enough for the job, not just baseball, but the job of being an ambassador for baseball as well in the South. I would just like to say that uh, I had a speech all written out. Uh, I've been thinking about this for two days, and uh, really, I'm choked for wood. But I would like this opportunity to thank all your fans and all the people that have participated in this night. And above all, I would say I would like to thank God for giving me the talent and knowledge to play this game. My recollections back in the early days of baseball, um, frankly, are very few because there was an issue overriding baseball, and that was civil rights. You must say somehow, I don't have much money. I don't have much education. I may not be able to read and write, but I have the capacity to lie. The death of Martin Luther King, uh, seemed to me like the end of the world, particularly when it was followed three months later by the death of Robert Kennedy. They were on the verge of bringing the world together, and to lose them uh, was devastating. Martin said to me a month before he died at my home, at my dinner table, he said, Don, you and Jackie and Roy will never know how easy you make it for me to do my job. It was a job we'd have to carry on without our leader. And it was all I could do to try to find a silver lining in this time of sorrow.
At 35, I was considered the Braves' elder statesman now. And again, I put my focus back on the ball field. Uh, I'm going down spring training with one thing on my mind. That's to uh, uh, try and bring back uh, a team or try to help some of the young kids on spring training that's uh, installed in some of their minds that uh, we have a good enough team so we can win the pennant and, and just try and bring a championship to the Atlanta people and the Georgia people. For the fourth time in his career, Hank Aaron hit 44 homers in 69. But more importantly, Aaron helped bring Atlanta its first big league crown. I was hungry for a championship ball club, and uh, we we're just happy and tickled to death that we were able to bring him a championship here. Some people have to close your train to express their pleasure. Hank Aaron just smiles and says, we did it. Why is that cool? I'm looking at it, and, and I'm saying, well, oddly enough, I'm going to face Henry Aaron in the playoffs. When he came up at Fulton County Stadium, I couldn't watch. You, there's a real struggle here in the sense of, well, there's the little kid in you that's looking at the idol and stuff, and the other side of me going, for me to do what I know I have to do to win a ball game, I can't watch it. Mostly, I can't watch this. And I knew what Henry Aaron was doing. I got a great lesson from arguably the greatest hitter to ever play the game. He knew I was throwing the ball in there. He opened up, boom, home run right down the left field line. Bingo. That went right back in the computer. I said, that's why these guys are good. That's why he's been so consistent all the time. He's thinking up there, too, isn't he? I said, wow, what an amazing game. <laughs> I hit three homers in that three-game period, but we got swept by the Miracle Mets. Still, nothing like playing in New York to get people to notice me. I don't, I don't think that ever, anybody ever got the full magnitude of, of Hank Aaron. I, I, I mean... To play against Hank Aaron, it, it wasn't a massive man. It wasn't somebody that brought fear into your heart when he walked to the plate. Uh, it was just a flick of the wrist. One of my biggest thrills was playing center field of all places when he got his 3,000 hits. Pitch on the way, the runner going to third. There's a bouncer up the middle, and that should be a base hit, and that is number 3,000. I'd always said I wanted to be the first black player to get 3,000 hits. And when my dear friend Stan Musial came out to greet me, I realized I'd just done something that players like Babe Ruth and Ted Williams had never accomplished. I played a golf tournament, and a lot of people ask me how I did, you know, and I tell them that uh, it taken me 17 years to get 3,000 hits, and I did that in an 18-hole golf course. So. <laughs> the hard hat on the soft hat and he would hold the bat between his legs and from a catcher's perspective you're looking at a man right here he's only three or four feet from you and he would go <clears throat> <clears throat> never more than twice and almost always twice and he would step in and he would never leave the box it was daring the pitcher to throw the ball anywhere in the strike zone he uh, gave me an image of a player who, who showed me what consistency was, what, what tenure meant. I had my best home run year ever at age 37, and one of my 47 homers put me in very select company. I think that he was the greatest right-hand hitter to ever play the game. When they discuss who hit the most home runs, who drove in the most runs, who was the most consistent, who has the biggest numbers, who is an enormously important part of the history of the game. It doesn't matter if they acknowledge or not. Just look it up. Well, today it was reported that Aaron has signed a three-year contract at $200,000 a year. Well, that's an increase of $75,000 a year, 60% over his present salary. And it makes him the highest paid player in baseball history. So why is this man smiling? The hard work is finally paying off. Most popular player by vote of the fans, Henry Aaron. And two years in a row to be selected this way, Hank, it's got to make you feel awfully good. Congratulations. I couldn't believe it, really. Henry Aaron, most popular player? But there I was in my 21st All-Star game. 
This was the year I passed Willie Mays in home runs, which made people wonder where I'd been all these years. It also made people say, maybe Aaron has a chance at Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs. Aaron hits them off of everybody. Hits the deep left field. The steps he goes back. Near the wall. Pushed up. He goes up the wall. That night in Atlanta, I got an ovation that made me feel more at home there than I ever had. But about the same time, I started hearing from some people who didn't exactly appreciate my success. Henry was at 650 with a, a great shot at going ahead, you know. And uh, uh, so the writers and everybody started writing a lot more about the assault on Ruth's record, and, you know, the mail started coming. Chase, man, that, that was like, uh, should have been the happiest time of his life, but it was probably the ugliest time of his life, really. It ended up our kids have to have bought bodyguards. That wasn't fair. My daughter almost got kidnapped in college. And I walk in the office, it's four or five men, and they flash their badges right in front of me, and I'm like, and then they say, we have received the call of an attempt to uh, kidnap you. In the back of my mind, I'm saying, where's my daddy? Does my daddy know you're here? I remember times my father would call me. Then when they had a day off, he would come to Nashville to be with me, OK? It was really hell. I just hated to see him go through what he went through, the letters, the phone calls. And my dad didn't stay with us, but we still got threats. He didn't come around sometimes because he was scared that whatever would happen would happen around us sometimes. So it was, it was a ball on the ground, and a guy kicked at me. And he, he goes, I hope your daddy die. When I really, really knew that this was getting to my father, he called me and he said, Gail, where are you? And I'm like, you just call me daddy. You know what I mean? Isn't that something? And I immediately call my grandmother, you know, because she's like the rock of Gibraltar. That is, she was scared. And so I told Gail, I said, Gail, don't be afraid. There were code names that we had to know to get in contact with my daddy. You know what I mean? And it was it, it was kind of hard. It was hard on my sister Dorinda. She was like nine, nine years old. Only thing was that I couldn't really go outside and play as much as I wanted to. I could only stay in front of the house. I was scared for him. I was scared because he was out there in the field and I didn't know what would happen to him if anybody would try anything while his back was to the crowd. So. And there were some death threats. I remember one in particular when he talked about there was going to be a guy in a red jacket that was going to shoot Hank in Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. I want to know why they want to hurt him. He's not, he wasn't taking anything from in the war. Who would hate Hank? He, he didn't seem to be that type of guy that uh, somebody would, you know, want to hate him because he, he's hitting home runs. We had an awful lot of unsigned clan mail with very crude drawings. The predominant racist mail came from the North, and to me that was a shock. All of the hate mail, because he was doing his job. I figured this chase was the ultimate test of my will. As I moved closer to the babe, I had to remind myself of what Jackie Robinson went through. Even to the very end, Jackie was still trying to kick down those doors. I'm extremely proud and pleased to be here this afternoon, but must admit I'm going to be tremendously more pleased and more proud when I look at that third base coaching line one day and see a black face managing in baseball. Thank you very much. Jackie died in 72, with so much of his work left unfinished. It was OK to have great talent and great skill and to display that, but it was even greater to be able to use all of that platform in the service of humankind. 
and the service of justice and the service of moral principle. And there, and I think Jackie, in the end, really prevailed. As I said goodbye to Jackie, I felt more and more like it was up to me to keep his dreams alive. I, I would like to read to you this morning a letter that I received yesterday from Chicago, and I consider this a real good letter, considering some of the letters that I've gotten in the past. And it reads as follows. Mention if you were white, they would give you more credit. That's ignorant, stupid. Hank, there's three things you can't give a nigga. A black eye, a puffed lip, or a jaw. <laughs> things like this really makes me push just that much harder. When I read a letter like People don't know the amount of pain that Hank played in. He had a bad back for years. He had sciatic nerve problems. And, uh, you know, I'd see him limp in like old man. And then, and then he'd sit down and read the newspaper. But his eyes wouldn't move. He would just look at the paper and stare and stare and stare. And he's thinking away pain. Your time's at bat compared to Ruth, say, and, and, and that sort of thing. And people are forever coming up with unpopular, unpopular concepts. I, I, don't, I don't really care what they say. I got 33, 3,400 hits, too, and Ruth didn't get that, so I don't care. Yeah, nothing that good a year for your boss. Huh? Everyone who knows you, you know, considers you quite a personable guy. And, and these, you know, it just seems like things are taken out of context. Do you think you'll do it in 1973? Or... Well, you're a reporter. Yeah. You don't know your colleagues. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, I know that. <laughs> the demands that were put on this man's time, night after night after night, hour after hour after hour, sitting after a ball game and answering question upon question upon question, I only saw him lose his cool one time. I put up with so much, no privacy, rude reporters. But when a guy started saying things about my family, I just couldn't take it no more. We felt sorry for Henry. He had 35, 40 people following him everywhere he went. It got to the point where I was getting 3,000 letters a day. Hank got a lot of letters about, we didn't want you to beat Brave Ruth and stuff like that, you know? Well, Roger got that same deal on the 61 homers. I guess it got pretty bad for Roger Maris, too, when he broke Babe Ruth's one-year home run record. Every day, TV's on you every day. You don't even get time to sleep. Poor Roger lost his hair for a little bit. And uh, I don't know how Hank was. You know, I wasn't there to see it. So he must have got pestered every day, every day. The abuse of Maris was aesthetic and stirred up by an older generation outraged at the idea that the hallowed record of Babe Ruth was going to be broken by somebody they did not consider a great player. In Aaron's case, I think it was not aesthetic, but racial. Babe Ruth was white. Hank Aaron was black. He was a black man threatening a record held by someone that was put up on a pedestal and looked up on as bigger than life. He wasn't boasting, he wasn't saying nothing. Baby Ruth was dead. I had to remind myself, most people were still rooting for me as I closed in on number 700. One and one account to Hank Aaron, who argues with plate umpire Ken Burkhart. Well, that might be the first time I've ever seen Hank Aaron argue on a pitch. There, 11, second base, nobody out. I got a couple uh, of letters that were brought to my desk that were death threats. I called the FBI, and they formulated the plan on how we would do this. The 
Braves and the Atlanta Police Department decided to hire me a personal bodyguard. In the beginning, I, I would meet him at the stadium, the clubhouse. Uh, and of course, I'd go out on the field whenever he went out on the field. Calvin was everywhere, and he always had that case with him. Well, I always got kidded about the, my uh, binocular case and the fact that I had a 38 snub nose. And... I was usually able to block it all out once I put on that uniform. I had a great year in 73, hitting 40 homers and batting 301. But when I got within 10 homers of the babe, the pressure got even worse. I never thought of quitting because that would have meant cheating myself, my fans, my family, and the good Lord who gave me the talent. But once in a while, I'd think about what an easy target I was out there if someone wanted to do something crazy. They said the black niggas ain't going to break that record. Say, so you better talk to him. Say, so you better talk to your son. I stack a little of that ring that high. Old kind of bad little. Now, I don't know who sent him. I, I, I can't put my hand on say the white sent him. I can't put my hand on say the black sent him. I, I don't know who sent him. But I know I got him. One fella called me one night. I don't know who I was at, at home. The thing I felt worst about was what they did to my family. Mama and Daddy still lived in the same house in Tolmanville. And just because their son was chasing a baseball record, they couldn't get a single night of peace. Hello? Kill that black son, bitch, son of yours. Your whole family. I never heard him that said nothing bad about Babe Ruth. That's the people's talking. Yeah, that's what people talk. And it, they talk and talk to, till they talk you down the ground in the, in the cemetery. He had two rooms. He'd sleep in one one night and then switch rooms the other night, go to the other room, and only would let us know what room he was in. By this time, Barbara and I had gotten a divorce and I felt more alone than I had in Eau Claire, more trapped than I had in Jacksonville. I prayed a lot that year, I remember, and a woman named Billy Williams came along to answer some of my prayers. She was there with Daddy as I continued my chase. Stretch pitch to Henry, swinging, there's a drive, left center, going, going, it's out of here for 7-13. Roaring in Atlanta State. Everyone wanted to see if I could do it, but I got stuck at 7-13 and finished the season one short of the record. After 20 years in the big leagues, it had all come down to me and the babe, and now I'd have to wait six long months. When I look back at that time in my life, I think I was kind of numb to it all. It wasn't about being sad or happy, just about surviving. I couldn't wait till spring to get it over with. Okay, the bitch is throwing the ball. Here we go. And hey, 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 wait, wait a second. <laughs> this is a dangerous weapon in the hands of the wrong man. <laughs> Look, I think you better not try it in the store here anymore. Look, I'm going to give you the bat, and I'll throw in the ball and the glove, and you and your nephew can practice at home. Let's see the entire course of everything, including the tax. We come to $7.14. Let's see. Well, seem to be a penny short. Will you sell for seven thirteen? Would you? No way. I know it. <laughs> Behind the laughter, I tried to make some sense out of all the ugliness. In a way, I felt more sorry for these people than angry at them. And lucky for me, I now had Billy to help me sort it out. It was a matter of our sort of getting to know each other and finding a shoulder uh, to lean on and someone that we could talk to about our own uh, personal problems. My mother, I had just lost my first father. And um, I guess I, I wanted a daddy. And so when he came to the house, um, I just asked him if he was standing there and he was a man. So I just said, are you going to be my daddy? My mother told me I'm getting married. And uh, I remember staring at him at the altar and thinking, there are not even words to describe how wonderful he was. As someone who'd had her own TV show, Billy seemed ready for the demands of our new life. Why are we 
perhaps the most important spring training of your career. I don't like to use the word nightmare, but it, uh, it started in the spring training, and they just overwhelmed everybody. Hank, whoever talked to him, Hank just went on being Hank. I remember one that had a, what was written uh, typed on a toilet tissue that had a gorilla head on it. It was a relief when opening day in Cincinnati finally arrived. Now I could try to get this thing over with, once and for all. Nothing like an opening day, is it? I was honored to see that Vice President Ford had come, even with all the problems facing him in Washington. Millions of Americans had lost faith in their government, in the White House, because of the tragedy of Watergate, the tragedy of the war in Vietnam. I guess this was a welcome break for the vice president, and thinking of his problems helped me keep baseball in perspective. Still, after playing in almost 3,000 big league games, somehow this one felt a little bit different. I was excited. I mean, uh opening day and you think well he's still a little bit rusty and uh, you know he's not ready for anything and it didn't make any difference if there's a seat empty i can't find it two balls and one strike Ball three. just won 19 games of previous years and i go three and one on hank and people start booing me you know, so all I hear is was booze from the stands. I'm going, wow, you know, everybody wants to see it. Dignitaries here from all over the country. Some 250 writers are here from the sports writing fraternity. 3-1 pitch. There's the drive into left field. That ball is going, going, and out of here. Henry Aaron has just tied Babe Ruth in the all-time home run parade. I certainly was thrilled to have a personal opportunity to congratulate him, chat with him, and wish him well. Thank you. Number 714, good luck for 715, and a good many more. It's a great day for you. It's a great day for baseball. The best to you. Thank you very much, and I'm just glad it's almost over with. Afterward, I got a telegram from another big baseball fan. When I think of Hank Aaron, I think of power and poise, of courage and consistency. But most of all, I think of a true gentleman, an outstanding citizen. On the field and off, Hank Aaron represents America at its very best. But even on this great day, I felt like I had to express my feelings on something more important than hitting home runs. I said the day was the day that Dr. King was killed, and uh, we were a little bit disappointed. I requested that uh, we have a moment of silence, and uh, for some reason they found that uh, the schedule didn't permit them to today, and, and I was just a little disappointed in it. Sometimes it seemed like we just kept fighting the same old battle and showing up when the court ordered the integration of Boston schools in 74, it looked an awful lot like Little Rock all over again. We came back to Atlanta, where I'd always hoped to break the record. And against my advice, Mama had decided to come up from Tolmanville. He said one thing about it. He said, I want some record of my own. He said, Baby Ruth got his record. I don't want his record. 
He said, I'm building a record for Hank Aaron. When the Braves play their home opener against the Dodgers, all eyes will be on Hammer and Hank Aaron, the greatest record in all. Well, the electricity was building up, and, he, and, and we recognized the pressure on Hank Aaron. And there was not only the thought of going down in history books, but there was the pressure of the racial interrelationship as well. I remember it being kind of a cold night, but the packed house included lots of celebrities. Pearl Bailey sang the national anthem. About the only one missing was the commissioner of baseball, who said something about not wanting to be a distraction. Mama said she wouldn't have missed it for the world. Oh, what a night. <laughs> I'll tell you, that was, that was the greatest thing in the world, but this was a, it was a scary thing. Security personnel was alerted that I was there, that I was armed, and if they uh, saw anything that I need to know about, to get word down to me. And I'm just hoping that this thing will get over with tonight as quickly as I possibly can. Thank you very much. All right, Henry. If he break that record, say so he never will be able to come to make it to home plate. Say, and then again, we go kill all of you. I tried to always approach it as a possibility, but in the back of my mind, I, I really couldn't come to grips with the fact that somebody would really do this just because of a, a record. I was batting cleanup between Daryl and Dusty, business as usual. Henry walked through the clubhouse early and said, I'm going to get it out of the way tonight, boys. Don't worry about it. It's, this is the night. I had a little trick to help me concentrate, staring at the pitcher through one of the holes in my helmet. Al Downing, sharing a spotlight of his own now. The quiet left-hander, nicknamed... If he's just hit 715, obviously he's got to run the bases. We had told all the security personnel, don't please keep your eyes and mind focused to the stands. As Henry begins to walk up the home plate, the crowd gives him a... Anybody to point the accusing fingers. He's just trying to pitch his game. Downing checking, Aaron waiting. And the 3 1 pitch is outside ball four. Uh, not right now, Henry. As he's got to first base. Aaron ain't got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't get the ball over the plate. And uh, again, I, I don't know that I was really mentally prepared for the first inning or two. It was like a three ring circus out there. People bought nets, and the Braves put infrared marks on the balls so they could keep track of them. It kind of reminded me of what I felt like when I was a kid anticipating Christmas. You knew it was going to happen, and the closer you got, the further it seemed away. Aaron Watt in the second inning. It will be interesting when he comes up again. And the 2 0 fish on the way is a ground ball behind second. That's where Russell is, and he splits, splits the throw. Up, I had Billy's hand talking to mother. You know, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. He means a tying run at the plate now. So we'll see what Downing does. Al at the belt delivers, and he's low. Ball one. And that just adds to the pressure. The crowd booing. Downing has to ignore the sound effects and stay a professional in pitches game. One ball and no strikes. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive into deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. 
It was all kind of a blur after that. I don't really remember those two kids. I'm just thinking I better make sure to touch all the bases. I don't think it was joy or excitement I was feeling. More just relief, like I could finally come up for air. I was thinking how happy I was for my teammates and my family, that they wouldn't have to put up with any of this anymore. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Mama coming straight toward me, looking like she was afraid for her life or mine. I'm telling you, she wasn't letting go till she was sure her boy was safe, even if it meant hanging on all night. I found myself outside on the field. And I said, well, I got to die with him. Let me, die, let me go down with him. Me and him go together. <laughs> well, I would just like to say, I'd just like to say to all the fans here this evening, and I just thank God it's all over with. Thank you very much. It is over. And for the first time in a long time, that poker face of Aaron shows the tremendous relief. What a marvelous moment for baseball. What a marvelous moment for Atlanta and the state of Georgia. What a marvelous moment for the country and the world. A black man is getting a standing ovation in the Deep South for breaking a record of an all-time baseball idol. And it is a great moment for all of us, and particularly for Henry Aaron. America would have preferred that someone else do it. If it had to happen, I think a lot of people prefer that someone more flamboyant might have done it. For an African-American out of Mobile, Alabama, quiet, unassuming, in a lot of ways, very, very withdrawn, it didn't sit well with a lot of people. And yet, in a lot of ways, he was the man to do it because he is a very good and decent human being. He does not gloat over any of his accomplishments. He lets the record speak for itself. And I think for a man with that kind of character and attitude to accomplish the, the record, the greatest of all baseball records, really is in baseball's best interest. And finally, it hit me. I thought of Jackie and all the people who made my dream possible, and of all the people whose own dreams would seem a little more possible after tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the home of Hank Allen. He happened to be the man who hit 715 home run last night here. This morning, Hank Aaron's Atlanta home was already on the tour bus route. Somewhere within, the hammer was trying to sleep off an all-night celebration. But when someone showed up with a brand-new TV console, Aaron came out to take delivery. He was met by State Department officials who came by to introduce a traveling journalist from Africa. What's your feeling today about number 715? Same way I was last night. I'm just glad it's over with. Al Downing, who threw the home run ball last night, was not available to us for comment. People said, I know you deliberately threw that ball down the middle. I said, why would I want to go for that re the rest of my life? You know, people you know, looking at me like, you know, yeah, I've done something terrible in life. As for the man who caught the ball, Braves relief pitcher Tom House, he recalls the Braves kidding Aaron about holding the ball for ransom if they caught it. We had heard that Sammy Davis Jr. was offering $25,000 for it. It's a good thing it didn't go in the stands, because if it would have, I, I think someone would have gotten hurt. And once I got it in my hand, I went nuclear. I mean, all I could think about was getting it back to him. It was a unique moment for me, seeing that kind of emotion in Henry Aaron, seeing tears in his eyes when I got to home plate. Aaron's bodyguard, Calvin Wardlaw, got the surprise of his life. And lo and behold, when I turn around, here's one guy and two guys running around the bases. Two long-haired teenagers patted Aaron gingerly on the back, then disappeared. As soon as he hit it, we knew it was it was going to be gone, and we jumped on the tarp, and then in between the policemen that were there. 
You know, I'm thinking, where are all the guys that are supposed to be watching the people running out of the stand? Instead of watching the stands, I think they were watching the home run. I think so. I don't remember anyone ever even, they didn't come close. No. But in my mind, do I take my weapon out? I didn't feel that they were a, a threat, a life threatening. This was only opinion, and of course it worked out. Well, I would like to commend Calvin on his excellent judgment. <laughs> Hank Aaron probably feels he beat the odds of what he had to go through, and yet still no one listens to him. And to overcome what he had to overcome, threats on his family, his own life, he had to meet all that and made it to that what we call the light at the end of the tunnel. More for the chance to be heard than for holding the record. I was feeling like it was all worth it now. He's probably made it possible. He's one of the ones that made it possible for me to walk through that door in 1975 with the Cleveland Indians. When Frank Robinson was named the big league's first black manager, it answered one of Jackie's final prayers. The same year, the new team in Milwaukee offered me their manager's job, but I chose to play a couple more years with the Brewers instead. My last home run, number 755, gave the kids something to shoot for. 755 home runs. Impossible. Straight impossible. That's just day in and day out. Yeah, dropping the hammer. <laughs> That's telling me that I, I probably would have to go out for 19, 18 years and hit 40, 45 home runs every year. It's amazing. I don't think that record will ever be broken. There's no way. Hank, you're crazy. <laughs> just straight crazy. There's just no, no one can do that. No one can, no, th that. Well, basically, I'm like 590 away. I managed an infield hit in my last at bat to finish with a 305 average. Feeling like I'd accomplished everything I could, I said goodbye to baseball. They call him the hammer. Henry Aaron. Yeah! Then Cooperstown came a calling the ultimate honor. It had been for me to quote a very popular song, a long and winding road. And At my Hall of Fame speech, I thank Jackie Robinson and all those who made it possible for me to be standing there. Then a few years later, another door opened when Bill White was named National League president. But with each step, we're reminded how far there still is to go. I'm tired of reading. Bill White, the highest white black official. And I really felt like what we used to call uh, the nigger in the window. I think we have to stick together as a people to make it happen, to, um, to keep, keep it going, to let, our, to let our younger brothers know that there is an opportunity out there and you can make it happen. You might have to work double time to make it happen, though. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel as long as we stick together. And Henry Aaron would be remembered a lifetime as far as the black community goes. He's the granddaddy of them all. I mean, he made it possible for us today. I would dare say that had Hank, Hank Aaron been white, he would have perhaps been the fifth face on Mount Rushmore. If he'd have played in Yankee Stadium, I mean, you know, they would have built another stadium because that was Ruth. They'd have one for Aaron. Hank Aaron made this world a better place to live because of his career, his thoughts, what he did on the field, off the field, and everything else. He's like, uh, still water runs deep. He's, he's a very deep person, uh, and he's thought it, thought it through very carefully, and he's seen a lot, and uh, he's, a, he's a right thinker. There never has been any question about the fact that not only was he a great athlete, but he's a great man. He is a better father than he was a baseball player. I've never thought about having a tattoo. I'd probably put it right on my forehead. Said I hit 755 home runs. Take a bite out of that. I can't even imagine trying to say my name in the same breath with Hank Aaron. So the things that Hank has done is the kind of stuff that melts my butter. Oh, yeah. I love you, Hank, and if you draw all right, I love you, Hank, you the best I've seen. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. He was the greatest ball player of all time. <laughs>